it is a pleasure uh, to present to your conference sort of the history of how single ventricle um, therapy has evolved here at St. Louis Children's Hospital since my time here. My name is Charles Cantor. I just as some background, I first came to Children's in 1979 as an intern and then proceeded to finish my residency in cardiology fellowship here and been on the faculty since 1986. Uh, when you do these types of things, it gives you an opportunity really to step back and reflect where things were and how they've evolved over a period of time. And in doing this talk, I hope I can show you how much things have changed. Sometimes when you look at change, you hope that the glass is all full and it's all good. And I think that's pretty much the case here. We're nowhere near where we would like to be ultimately, but there have been many, many strides in the care of these children uh, since I've been here for 40 years. And again, yes, I have been here, as Dr. Lee said, for decades, though it seems just like a couple of years once you get involved in things. So, as I said, I first arrived here as an intern in July of 1979. At that time, uh, patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome were offered no real therapy because there was really nothing we could do for them. It was very evident then that they generally died very quickly after birth, likely because the patent ductus arteriosus closed, which eliminated most uh, blood flow to the organs. So back at that time, when a patient was di di diagnosed here at Children's with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, there were extensions. There, he would get the patient would get a cardiac catheterization. There would be discussions with the family, basically telling them about the futility of the situation. And often, the patient was just discharged home to the family and expired at home. Very, very different than how we would handle this situation today. There was no routine surgical plan leading to the Fontan procedure. However, that being said, the Fontan procedure had only been first described in the pediatric cardiac literature in 1973. There were some Fontans that were being done at that time, but it was pretty limited and was not routine care. The primary goal then, when a baby was born with other forms of single ventricle was try to get them to survive for five years of age and then see where things ended up. 10 years later, in 1990, a lot of things had happened. We had started to do stage one Nord procedures here at St. Louis Children's, but we weren't very successful with them. Around that time, uh, the techniques of infant heart transplantation for hypoplastic left heart syndrome had been developed at Loma Linda Hospital in California, and given our poor results with the NORAD procedure, we went down the path of beginning primary heart transplantation here in St. Louis. Our first um, primary heart transplantation for hypoplastic left heart syndrome was done in 1987. By that time, there was enough experience with the Fontan procedure. And if a patient with a single ventricle, hypoplastic left heart syndrome or other, survived to around age five, then generally the Fontan procedure was offered as a final step in palliation of any single ventricle lesion. By 1990, our primary goal was survival past the Fontan procedure. And since that had been so well, people really didn't know from that point what the future would be. That included also heart transplantation in children. I continue to be inspired and amazed um, by many of the families who agreed to pursue uh, a primary heart transplant option for their infants at that time, given there were so many unknowns. Some of those patients still survive today with their original heart are now adults. And which I, I quite honestly, I don't think anybody expected. I know when we started doing those procedures, the director of pediatric cardiology here told me that he felt we would be lucky if they survived for 10 years. 
but they've certainly done better than that. By the turn of the century here, like in most pediatric heart centers, therapy for hypoplastic left heart syndrome had pretty much evolved into no longer offering the primary heart transplant option, the NORD procedure, or supportive care, but involved with really a recommendation for the three-stage procedure, three-stage strategy that most of you are familiar with today. The last patient, I believe, who opted for supportive care and no therapy was probably around 1995 or 1996. I do know the last primary transplant for hypoplastic left heart syndrome we did here was in 1997. The last time I saw her, she was going to college at the University of Illinois. And to my knowledge, she's still alive at this time with her first heart. It was around that time in 2000 that we established the first formal fetal echocardiography cardiology clinic here at St. Louis Children's Hospital. Fetal echocardiography Fetal echocardiography had been performed in conjunction with the obstetrical service prior to that, but by 2000 had become a critical part of evaluation of single ventricle and other congenital lesions. So that was the time that we established the formal fetal echo program that you all have had involvement with today. By 2000, because of the success in these procedures, our primary goal had also shifted, and it was to survival to adulthood. Because some patients with single ventricles and many other patients with other types of congenital heart disease were surviving to age 21, it was around this time that the adult congenital heart disease clinics were established at Barnes Hospital with adult cardiologists. Initially, they didn't have special expertise in congenital heart disease, but they learned it quickly. And the clinic as you, has now has evolved to multiple adult congenital uh, adult congenital cardiologist, which is now a specific subspecialty in adult cardiology. And it's the largest of that type of clinic in the state of Missouri and likely in the region here south of Chicago. So moving on here for the last 20 years, by 2010, we'd established uh, the, our first infant cardiac neurodevelopmental clinic to follow closely those infants who had had initial stage one palliations. This occurred in con conjunction with most other pediatric heart centers around the country be because as survival improved, it was increasingly apparent that many of these children uh, had developmental disabilities, not only as a result of their operations, but it also became apparent from fetal research that many single ventricle children are born with uh, abnormalities of their central nervous system that are unrelated uh, to the procedures they receive to allow survival in childhood. Thus, it became critically important to evaluate those children to optimize their development. That clinic was established. Around the end of that decade, around 2008 and 2009, we first started seeing increasing number of older adolescents and young adults who were experiencing heart failure and seemed to be candidates for heart transplantation. In many ways, the fourth stage of surgery for hypoplastic left heart syndrome and other single ventricle patients. This was solely due to the fact that the Fontan procedure had been successful enough to get these patients into adolescence and to an adulthood. And in many ways, this reflects the unknown and the unknown consequences of long-term uh, life with physiology in the Fontan circulation. We were beginning to discover that the liver developed complications after many years with the Fontan. It became evidence from our own, evident from our own clinical experience here, as well as other centers around the country and around the world, that often as patients with a Fontan survive 10, 20, 25, 30 years, they are at high risk for developing heart failure, arrhythmias, and other complications. Thus, a good portion of our adult congenital heart clinic these days is made up of adults with the Fontan procedure. Many of those 
who, whose initial lesion was hypoplastic left heart syndrome. By 2010, however, our primary goal of therapy had evolved to not just surviving out of the pediatric years, but ongoing survival into adulthood. Today, uh, in, in the 2020s, uh, we have developed, as other centers, a high-risk infant surveillance clinic after initial therapy, knowing that the time between the first and second operation in the first six months of life is a period of high risk and high interstage mortality. In addition, another clinic that's been established is actually surveillance for the long-term non-cardiac complications associated with the Fontan uh, procedure. That clinic currently uh, starts seeing patients around 10 years of age. It is multidisciplinary and includes uh, physicians from hepatology, looking for the liver complications with the Fontan, but also kidney specialist, pulmonary specialist, endocrine specialists, because all of those organ systems can be affected by the Fontan procedure in addition to cardiac complications. In many ways, it's also a good idea to really establish the natural history of these non-cardiac complications, especially in terms of the liver. The liver disease that's associated with the Fontan procedure, what is now called Fontan-associated liver disease, really remains somewhat of a black box. We really don't understand uh, what leads to it because some patients will have no evidence of disease. Some patients will have severe disease, including cirrhosis, at the same age or at the same time after the Fontan. What the long-term outcome is and what the long-term natural history is remains uncertain. Unfortunately, it has become known that one of the long-term complications of the Fontan procedure is a hep hepatocellular carcinoma, which may occur in as much as one to two percent of Fontan's survivors. Because of these liver complications, we as others have actually begun to do heart liver transplantation for failed Fontan with end-stage liver disease. The first one first patient we did here in St. Louis was a 16-year-old who had been born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome who came for transplant evaluation for protein-losing enteropathy, a complication in the gut of the Fontan, but then on transplant evaluation was found to have hepatocellular carcinoma. He received a successful heart-liver transplantation and currently is in college. Our primary goal continues to be ongoing adult survival. Now we do tr transplants here for failed Fontan procedures in patients into adulthood because of the need for congenital surgery expertise in doing the procedure. Here at St. Louis Children's Hospital, the oldest Fontan survivor for which we've done transplantation is a 45-year-old from Springfield, Missouri, who was successfully done two years ago. So looking ahead into the future, I think our goal these days is not just to improve survival, but to improve neurodevelopmental outcomes in those children who are getting surgery. We definitely need to improve understanding and treatment of the morbidities, both cardiac and non-cardiac, associated with Fontan physiology. And of course, we would certainly like to decrease reliance on organ transplantation for long-term adult survival. Speaking as someone who's been involved with cardiac transplantation and congenital heart disease for decades, I think we get our greatest satisfaction not so much on finding a way to do a successful transplant, but finding things we can do in those patients to avoid transplantation. We'd like to do more of the latter than the former. Again, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope th this little talk puts in perspective some of the some of your experiences here these days and it's been and i appreciate dr lee giving me the opportunity to speak at your conference today